I am incredibly out of my comfort zone standing here and talking to you today. So already I'm wobbling a bit. Um, I'm a nutritional therapist. So if you're here today, and I was standing up here today to talk to you about blood sugar balance or how important it is to eat every single meal, I would take you through all the stats and I'd have no problem. I would have no fear. In fact, I'd be out of my own body and delivering the most passionate subjects I am passionate about. But today, I'm not going to do that story. Today, I'm going to tell a story that I spent a lot of my life trying to hide from. So I am going to share the real me. So it is about... Um, thank you. Learning to be myself. I'm not there yet. I'm work in progress. And you'll soon see. Um, and do you know, I just have to say, I've, I'm really grateful to have you guys as the first people I'm going to share this with, um, because I feel that you're going to help me through. Um, I am up for today, so I'm going to do my best. But there's one part of my story, as I said, that I haven't said publicly. And when I get to it, I might start shaking even more than I'm already shaking. <laughs> so if I do, I might need your help. We got you. <laughs> You'll know when it's coming because the slides are going to lead me to it. Um, and I'll, anyway, I'll begin. So this is the journey I'm going to take you on today. My problem, the problem I have, the problem I spent my life hiding. So today is a world first. I've not said this publicly. That's led to me producing coping mechanisms, right, to be able to deal with the problem so nobody can find it. That led me to a energy crisis. And then, thankfully for me, there was a change in circumstances that led to a reset. And then today is really about acceptance. This is a quote. I was looking for a quote to try and talk about my story. And this is nearly there, right? The story is about purpose. But my story is about more than purpose. It's about how I got to my purpose and how that's led me to my life work. And you'll soon see um, what um, you'll soon see what the most important part of that is. So the problem. My mum always says, I knew something was wrong when you were five. Most children can read and write by the time they are five. I couldn't do any of these things. To be clear, it took me seven more years. That's 100% more of my lifetime. I have this really strong memory I was in primary school, can't remember exactly what age I was, but I was sitting in the back of the class. Everyone's in the class, and the teacher said to me, Sarah, can you leave? And I could see my mum in the corridor. I didn't know why. I felt ashamed, I felt hurt. And I knew at that point there was something wrong with me and I was different, but I didn't know what it was. The time my dad was in the Air Force, so we were moving every six months. I'd stay on the local campuses and I'd attend all the local schools. Many of these schools just could not support me because I was simply just too far behind. The thing is, when you're a child, success is measured by your ability to read write and do arithmetic. I just couldn't do any of these things. So it's coming, right? I spent most of my life hiding this in fear and in shame because of the experiences I'd had as a child. I am severely dyslexic. 
I consent to anticlimax, and that's okay. <laughs> but to me, this was huge. Being chucked out of schools, being branded a failure, not being able to achieve the most simplest of tasks. I thought, how ever am I going to survive in this world? So I had to do something. So I said to myself, I've got to come up with some strategies because nobody can find out. Because if anybody finds out, then I'm just not going to progress. But to me, this is how I felt. <laughs> stupid. So I grew up thinking, I am stupid. I couldn't tell anybody that, or I couldn't share that with anybody, because if they found out, then they would believe me too. So I came up with two coping mechanisms. One was to work hard, and I'm eating fucking hard. If I could just achieve one thing, I thought, no one will find out. And along the way, all I had to do was mask the truth. So dodge and divert those activities that may just show up my flawed and imperfect brain. I had to learn how to teach myself. So I got taken out of the education system for two years. In those two years, I learned to read and write. And while I was learning to read and write, I learned how to teach myself. And I got back in the normal education system when I was about 12. So I'd pretty much missed everything up until that point. But this was valuable for me. Because my brain would not work. I couldn't see or read the words on a page. So I had to do something. It was a effing struggle. <laughs> I literally working hard, trying to achieve something to hide and mask my truth is like pushing a bus uphill. But that, that hill just kept getting steeper. But I knew it was OK. I knew if I could just get to the end of the road, all I needed to do was get my education, and then my life would be back. Be fine, be fine. My plan worked. I got 11 GCSEs, three A levels, and a first class degree. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I thought, I'm okay. I can finally get on with my life. I can finally just get rid of this. And I always want to pause at this point and just say, I'm incredibly grateful for my coping mechanisms. And they were subconscious. And I, I think my parents have a huge part to play in that because they really supported me and they believed in me. And I'm incredibly lucky. In fact, my dad fought for me. Being a military pilot, he was stubborn. He was like, I don't care what anyone else says. You're going to push yourself through this. And I thought, when I was writing this, I thought, I've got to be grateful to this, right? There's so many other routes I could have gone down. I could have turned, I could have rebelled against everything. So I just want to pause and be grateful, though it has caused me problems. Um, so all I had to do now was get a job. So I went straight from university into a marketing role. I thought, I didn't want to do marketing. But I chose marketing because I got a degree in it. I thought, this is the only way to go, right? This is the best route for me. Plus, to this point, I felt like I had blacked everything. Couldn't believe I'd got here. So I was like, maybe marketing's the way to go for me, because I can continue that journey. Um, the thing with um, coping mechanisms is we get better at them. We refine them. And I thought that by the time I'd gone into the marketing industry and got that job, my beliefs of me being stupid would just disappear. No, they came to work with me. So I just got harder at my coping mechanisms. 
I just had to work hard. I just had to do better than the person next to me and then nobody would find out and still continue to masking. I was literally earning my black belt. The other problem with coping mechanisms is they don't last forever. Reality always wins. Something comes crashing down. You cannot hide forever. And at this point, this was me. I was burning all of my energy trying to just stay alive because I felt I had to hide the truth about myself. And I was seriously crashing at this point. But the worst thing, and I could not see this at the time, is that when you spend all your energy outwardly, trying to survive in your environment, try to be accepted, try to be seen as normal, there is nothing left for me. Who am I? What is important? Or how to take care of myself? I was empty and I was depleted. The marketing industry is also ruthless. It's very competitive. You're working long hours. You're expected to exceed client expectations all of the time. I thought, oh my god, what have I gone and done? I've just set my coping mechanisms to hyperdrive. I look like I'm having fun. Seriously, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Underneath, I was barely surviving. On the outside, I was looking OK. But I was fighting for myself and fighting against myself. I was living disrupted routines, had erratic eating behavior, overdoing it, not sleeping. I was completely lost and I was severely close to burnout. So, but at this point, not only was, was I crashing my energy at its lowest, my health was on a very downward trajectory. I was not in a good place. Lucky for me, and a change in circumstance, I moved from London to Bristol with my husband, and um, still in the marketing, marketing industry, but a different job. And I thought, who the hell am I? I cannot live like this. Something has got to change. I've got to do something. I slowed down. And in slowing down, I decided that I've got to start looking after myself. So I changed, my, I changed my nutrition first, I changed my food. I changed what I ate, when I ate, how I ate. I put some boundaries between work and life, and I focused on my sleep. I couldn't believe it. Within about eight weeks, my health completely changed. My energy was back. My symptoms had gone. I was thinking clearer. I, could, I was starting to feel for myself. Slowing down had helped me listen to my intuition. My whole education has been about not listening to my intuition. It was about the numbers, the stats, the figures. I had to get the qualifications to be accepted. I didn't trust myself. It didn't matter what I thought of inside. That wasn't what was important. But slowing down and changing my nutrition had made me realize for the first time how important it is to really take care of yourself. Um, so in the reset, um, I thought things were getting really better. I felt better, but I wasn't quite there. I knew I had to still do some more work. So I was like, okay. So I was feeling better, and I was asking myself, what had happened to me? What had physically changed in my body? So how, had I, how come... Over a two-month period, I suddenly had all this energy back. I was going, right, I've got to find out what's going on. So at the time, I was doing everything I could to find out the mechanisms that may have been at play. And what I noticed that I was doing is everything I was doing was all about, I was reading a lot about nutrition. So I was going, right, nutrition's at the center of all of this. So I've got to learn more. So I listened to my intuition this time. 
and I needed to know the why behind the what. And I listened. And it said I had to go back to school. I said, what? You've got to be joking. The system that literally embedded my belief that I am stupid, I had to face that system head on, knowing that studying is an absolute nightmare for me. And I have to work so hard to get through it. But this time was different, right? This was not about me necessarily getting the stats and the figures. This was me doing something for myself, and therefore my motivation was different. We all know we have to have qualifications to do certain jobs, so I knew I had to do this. I had to face my fear head on and just get in that environment, and I did. It was another language. For me, that was what I saw. But I did it. I went back to the education system for three years, and I studied nutrition. And it was the best thing I have ever done. But what's interesting was me slowing down enabled me to listen to my intuition that helped me birth my purpose. So dyslexia has given me gifts. Would you want it? God, no, I'd avoid it if I were you. <laughs> First one was to work hard. I had to work really, really hard. That is a gift, I guess, because we all have to work hard, but it can also be, as you see today, it can be a detriment. And I have succeeded. I have the qualifications. I am good enough. What's interesting is dyslexia slows me down. It takes me time to understand things, to analyze things. Standing here today, accepting this, ironically, lets me slow down. And you know what? That's a gift. Slowing down helped me listen to my intuition. It was my intuition that gave birth to what was so important to me. And today, I'm saying, Sarah, this is you. Let yourself be yourself. It's OK. And to stop focusing on my inadequacies, but to focus all my attention on my pursuit to help people live better. And when I do that, not only am I in a better headspace, to give all my energy, but I serve my clients better. This is not about me anymore. I am not stupid. So to my lessons, and these are lessons that I've learned through my journey that I hope some of you can take them away today. But my weakness makes me powerful when I accept it. When I fully immerse myself in what I love, my limiting beliefs, they just disappear. The most important relationship I have is the relationship I have with myself. If I don't get that right, it has a knock-on effect everywhere else, to my family, to my friends, to my daughter, to my clients. And it begins with solid foundations, and that begins with good nutrition, movement, Exercise, time in nature, family. We have to fill ourselves up. To trust myself, to be less self-critical. And to my daughter, not to be constrained by the education system. Growing up is learning out who you are, what matters most, and what you love. So someone said to me today, what's my story about? It's actually about slowing down to listen to yourself because we have the answers inside. And when we do, we look after ourselves. And when we look after ourselves, we can do all the things that we really want to do. But we forget we all do. We all, our lives get in the way and we put ourselves to the bottom of the list. But we've got to put ourselves to the top of the list to have the energy to do everything else we want to do. So coming back to Mark Twain's quote, you know, I think what this is actually about, it's about how lucky we are to be alive against all of the odds. 
And if we really look at that and think about that, we're precious. What do we do with things that are precious? We look after them. We respect them. We take care of them. We put them first. We are all precious. And when we do do that, maybe we can get closer to what our purpose is. Uh, sorry. So I'm grateful for my dyslexia in my intuition. And today is about me standing up here, being brave, revealing the full truth to you. And I am also incredibly grateful for you to listen. Thank you.